Nexus PMG welcomes you to the Bigger Than Us podcast, which we as energy geeks lovingly refer to as the BTU. Bigger Than Us is a podcast that focuses on ideas that will shape the future of our planet and ultimately our existence. We will occasionally lean into energy topics because after all, it's the key to our collective survival, but we'll also explore other ideas and topics that we believe will have an impact that is bigger than us. And now, on to today's show. Hello and welcome to the Bigger Than Us podcast. I'm your host, Raj Daniels, and today I'd like to welcome Dr. Graciela Chichilniski to the show. Dr. Graciela Chichilniski is the founder and CEO of Global Thermostat and co-creator of a carbon removal technology that can reverse climate change. Under Dr. Chichilniski's leadership, the company was awarded a silver designation on Pepperdine's Graziado Business School's 2020 Most Fundable Companies list, and its technology was chosen by MIT Technology Review as one of the 10 Breakthrough Technologies of 2019, a list curated by Bill Gates. In addition to her role at Global Thermostat, Dr. Chichilniski is a professor of economics and mathematical statistics at Columbia University and the director of the Columbia Consortium for Risk Management. Dr. Graciela, how are you doing today? Doing fine, thank you. Glad to be here in your program today. Dr. Graciela, I'm very excited to interview you. You know, I usually like to open the show by asking my guests to share something interesting about themselves. But before I get to that question, I have a question for you. How does one earn two PhDs without an undergraduate degree? Not easily. (laughs) It happened to me by necessity because I left Argentina where I was born after finishing high school, just finishing high school, when the universities had been closed by a military coup d'etat that made it impossible to continue studying there. And I came to MIT in Boston to continue my studies. And it turned out when they tested me for over a year or so, they decided that even though I hadn't done college, I qualified because of my performance, to do a PhD in mathematics, which I did. And then subsequently, you earned a second PhD. That's correct. I wanted not just to do mathematics, which I love, but also to participate in some of the most important problems of human organization, which I consider the area where humans are really behind. And... I chose economics for that reason. So I went to UC Berkeley and I did a second PhD there. So I admire that tremendously. I had the great pleasure recently of interviewing Dr. Ralph Shami from the IMF, who also studied economics. He has a PhD in economics. And I find that, you know, specifically in the area of climate change and climate tech, we are finding more and more professional economists involved in this sector What drew you to this sector? In Argentina, there was uh, a group of very prominent scientists from several disciplines who were trying to answer MIT's limits to growth computerized model of the world economy that showed that we were starting to run out of resources and implying through the Club of Rome that that meant developing nations should not try to develop because they would exhaust the natural resources if they did. So very prominent scientists and politicians decided to organize and create a Latin American um, world economic model called the Bariloche, Bariloche model that was uh, created by me actually, from the economic and mathematical point of view, but with very prominent scientists of a number of disciplines, biology, geology, meteorology, etc. And that model 
was able to show that if we focus on basic needs instead of maximizing GDP, which is what we do now, then it is possible for the developing nations to reach their objective without depleting the global resources. That concept of basic needs is something I created. And in the year 1992, at the Earth Summit of Rio de Janeiro, the United Nations Summit, it was voted by 150 nations as the most important concept of economic development. And it became the foundation of the concept of sustainable development, which is now adopted by the group of 20 as the leading concept for economics in the world. So I'd like to double click on that for a minute. Can you share some of that framework regarding the basic needs? I'm very interested. Yes, the current notion of economic progress is to take the sum of all the goods and services that the economy produces at their market prices and try to maximize that number. That number is called the GDP or the gross, um, the gross production, the, 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 the gross value of production of the nation in dollars or in the local currency. But that's called the GDP, gross domestic product, GDP. Now, as it turns out, our prices are all wrong because some of the most important assets in the world which are the assets that allow humans to survive and thrive and are necessary for our survival. For example, air, without which we cannot survive for more than a few minutes, or water, without which we cannot survive for more than a few days, or food, without which we cannot survive for more than a few weeks. Those have the availability of those goods has no value in the GDP. Clean air, no value. Clean water, no value. Biodiversity, which is where we get our food, no value. So the concept of GDP, which is based based on economic value, moves in the opposite direction of what humans need for survival. Because all the things we need for survival have no value, while the GDP maximizes the economic value, we need something totally different to survive. So it became a point where the more efficiently the world economy grows, the worse are the possibility of survival of the human species. Because the concept of economic progress moves in an opposite direction from the concept of survival. Basic needs tries to address that problem. Basic needs is about the survival of the human species and the thriving of the human species. So it does consider a harmonious relation with the resources, water, air, food, positively. And that's why I introduced it, because I had a feeling that human gun was in a course of uh, collision with the ability of humans to survive in the face of enormous economic success. So how could it be? That's crazy. And not only crazy, but it's dangerous and it's catastrophic. So we actually published a book that became very well-known, translated to 11 languages called Catastrophe or New Society, and pointed out that society has to focus on basic needs in order for a humankind to survive, which is what I just said before. And that what we're doing now is in a collision course with human survival because it maximizes the market value of goods and services that measure uh, something else, not survival and not thriving of people and their environment. So that's how I got involved into the notion that global resources were not just something to count or was not just petroleum or water or whatever, but it was connected to human organization 
And basic needs are the way in which human can grow, develop in a way that is harmonious with the world resources and with each other. So do you know how we landed on this concept of GDP and driving towards efficiency and not basic needs? Yes. Um, this is a concept that emerged earlier on, but it became very widely accepted uh, in the last century and became more or less single-minded, the objective of all the economies, particularly when the bread and wood institutions were created and globalization took hold after the Second World War. It started before, but it is then that it became absolutely single focus for the world economy, even in nations that had other purposes, even in nations like China or the Soviet Union that were supposedly preoccupied with other uh, social models. And yet, that is the process that is used now, and it is our obsession with markets, which are extremely valuable institutions, but need to be understood for what they are. They are a very valuable tool to reach economic objectives, but they do not determine the economic objectives. So at this point, I think humans are starting to realize we need to redress the price system, the value system. We have to change our values, which are currently given by market values. And the way to do that, almost paradoxically, uh, which is very successful, is by creating markets for the basic environmental goods, such as clean air. So following the idea I just told you, in the year 1997, I designed and negotiated within the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, the concept of the carbon market, in which we essentially change values to address the fact that uh, emissions of carbon are very costly and that clean technology, clean energy is very valuable something that did not appear from the conventional markets. The carbon market that I designed and negotiated in 1997 then was adopted by 160 nations that voted, voted it as a main concept. And in the year 2005, it became international law. It was created to reduce the carbon concentration in the atmosphere of the planet, which everybody knows now is causing catastrophic climate change. And the market started trading, the market I designed and I negotiated, and I even wrote into the Kyoto Protocol in 1997, which became international law in 2005, became what is known now as the European Union Emission Trading System. And running quickly to the present, in the year 2020, a physicist in a magazine, for example, called Physics Today, uh, were able to document, validate that that market that I created in 1997, uh, as implemented by the 27 nations of the European Union, and the two, 450 million people in the European Union was able to reduce between 20 and 30% the emissions of CO2 of the European Union, despite a very high rate of growth over that period, between the year 2005 and 2020. So it works. So the number one issue is that the main piece that we need to put in place to resolve climate change the policy is already proven, has already been successful, successfully demonstrated, it is the carbon market. And there is very general agreement now by economists, even by physicists, as I said, that that is the solution. Even oil companies such as Exxon 
are in favor of the carbon market. The carbon market changes prices, making everything which is clean more valuable, everything which is dirty and ruins the atmosphere and causes climate change less valuable. And that change orients us to a new system of values for what I call green capitalism. Capitalism where the more you grow the economy, the more you drive humans towards survival and thriving and not to the destruction of the basic resources on which our survival depends. So that's a very amazing story. But in my research, I found that you thought the carbon markets were not doing enough, which led you to start Global Thermostat. So can you share with the audience what exactly Global Thermostat is and your role at the organization? Yes. Um, I think Global global Thermostat is not a reflection of the failure of the carbon market. The carbon market is now used by over 25% of humankind. It's used in China, in 14 states in the United States, and in the uh, European Union, as I mentioned. So, And it's been very successful and proven. But the problem is time. Markets and market prices can be used to orient the economy in the right direction, and the carbon market does that. But you can use the market to get there as fast as you need to go. The market is not taking the speed into consideration. Physicists know that we're running out of time, that this is a race against time, that now we only have a decade or two to remove enough CO2 from the atmosphere because otherwise the consequences in climate change with the North and the South Pole melting down with the seas going up all over the world, with the catastrophic floods, storms, and fires that are observed all over the world, we're not going to survive that, not our civilization as we know it today. So we need to do something very quickly. As I said, market, the carbon market was able to restore the right pricing system, and it works but it doesn't work as fast as we need it. And in fact, it is a physical issue that how fast it has to go. It's something that depends on the gases, on the properties of the atmosphere, not on economics. So I decided, I was then the um, lead US author of the Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change. That was the year... 2007, when I was, 2006 and 2007, that's when the IPCC, this organization, was given the Nobel Prize together with Al Gore, then the vice president, for his work on climate change. And I found out through the work of the thousands and thousands of scientists from all over the world that belong to the IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, that it was no longer sufficient to reduce emissions because we had delayed doing so so long that now we had overshot and we had to remove the legacy CO2 that was in the atmosphere. When I found this out, that was, as I said, in the year 2006, um, I decided that this had to be done. And then I thought, again, markets, Markets are a great institution. The carbon market is a market, very valuable, and it succeeds. So I decided that we need markets to assist and to accelerate this process. So I decided that we need a technology that can remove the CO2 from the atmosphere, clean the atmosphere of the planet so that it stops the growth of climate change and do so in a way that is profitable, in a way that is consistent with markets. Because I thought, if it is consistent with markets, the profit motive will move it forward. And that's what we need, markets, like in the case of the carbon market. But this time, 
a profitable technology that can remove CO2, clean the atmosphere in a way that is profitable, creates jobs, and grows the economy. That seemed to be impossible, but it was possible. It is possible, and it is happening now. So the creation of the Global Thermostat was the creation of a company that would take economic advantage and would make profits from cleaning the atmosphere and reversing climate change. My last book, published about six months ago, called Reversing Climate Change, explains the whole process, explains how I created Global Thermostat with my incredible partners, very impressive, and how we uh, co-invented the technology that removes CO2 from the atmosphere, how to make money by taking that CO2 and converting it into synthetic fuels like clean gasoline that comes from air and water, or uh, desalinated water that comes from the ocean and is what we need, humans need to drink, or polymers that are clean, uh, or uh, beverages, foods, etc. So cement, other building materials, carbon fibers, etc., etc. So all of that is a new type of economy, an economy that instead of being based on petroleum, is based on the CO2 that we take from air. The technology is called direct air capture. Global Thermostat has the most advanced, lowest cost technology to remove CO2 from air and is now a commercial firm and is breaking even and growing very impressively. There is other two firms in that same area, so we are now creating a small industry worldwide. And it is now accepted, for example, by the MIT Technology Review, that that technology I'm talking about, is, uh, which is called a breakthrough, is among the 10 breakthrough technologies in the world, was identified by MIT Technology Review and by Bill Gates, as the, as I said, top 10 breakthrough technologies in the world economy. So that was last year. That's where we are today. And it is now accepted uh, by the current government, President Biden, that that is the technology that has to be implemented now, right now. And, you know, starting from a situation where everybody thought we were crazy, trying to clean the atmosphere, we now have the support of some of the leading members of the current administration for the purpose of cleaning the atmosphere in a way that creates jobs, increases exports, and grows the economy. Everything fits together, everything moving in the right direction. So that is why I created Global Thermostat. And I must say, it was the right thing to do. It was very difficult, but it was the right thing to do. So how many facilities do you currently have and what do the plans look like? The plans look like little buildings. Uh, the one that is perhaps better known because it's more accessible and anybody can visit is at the Stanford Research Institute in the middle of Silicon Valley. And it removes about 1,000 tons a year. It's a relatively small unit. And um, it looks very nice, I think. It's very handsome. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but now we have three plants that were, grown, were, were built, and we are in the process of transforming those into tens and thousands of plants for the purposes of producing, as I said, uh, synthetic gasoline, which is identical to gasoline, but instead of being produced from petroleum, is produced from air and water. We're doing that for automobile companies. We're doing that with the top engineering companies in the world. There is a, there is a project in Chile called AME that is produced with Siemens, and we're working with them to produce all the synthetic gasoline that a firm like Porsche can use, an automobile firm like Porsche can use. And that means that you can run automobiles without changing anything, not changing the engine, nothing, no infrastructure change. Or you can run automobiles that 
burn gasoline, but do not uh, increase the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere because the CO2 that use, is used in the production of the gasoline comes from air. So it's a closed cycle. So this is one example, and there are many. McKinsey uh, validates that the market for using CO2 from air commercially is approximately a trillion dollars with tears in Tom this decade. And nevertheless, despite all this work that is succeeded and is succeeding, we still need to go faster now because human organization is perhaps what we are worst, worst at. And we need to accelerate this process or it will be too late. So we are now in a race against time to accelerate the process and produce tens of thousands of these units to serve all the markets I mentioned, desalinating water, synthetic gasoline, beverages and food, materials for construction all over the world. So that is what we're doing now, and it has to be accelerated so that within the next 10 or 15 years, we should be removing 40 gigaton of CO2, legacy CO2, CO2 that is already in the atmosphere, every year. And that will do the process of reversing climate change, cleaning the atmosphere. That's what we're trying to do, and it's very demanding, but it has to be done. It is the vaccine against global climate change. So between all the new technologies and the carbon markets, it sounds like all the pieces are now in place. But can you tell me what's missing? Yes. First, I'll tell you there is another extremely important piece, which the, Car the Kyoto Protocol carbon market facilitated, extremely important, revolutionary, that also came together in 2020, like the carbon market demonstrated its success, like the technology I just mentioned. That piece is the fact that solar energy is now the most, the, the least expensive, the most efficient, least expensive form of producing power all over the world for the first time in history. That became well known this year, last year, 2020. An unbelievable year in so many ways, but it led to this extraordinary piece in the puzzle that you describe, which is a long-term technology that is not going to destroy the env environment and it has enough power to substitute for all the fossil fuels, including coal, natural gas, and petroleum in the production of energy. Energy production is an activity that is about 60 trillion, with tears in Tom, dollars in the world economy and is critical for economic growth. And now it can be done from the sun using solar photovoltaic technology that was partly subsidized, if you wish, or with liquidity that was offered by the clean development mechanism of the Kyoto Protocol. So this is the third piece, and you are right. In the year 2020, it has become clear that all pieces are in place. As I said, clean technology that is enough to replace all fossil fuels and is very inexpensive, the most inexpensive in the world in producing electricity. The carbon market as a policy and the removal of CO2 from the atmosphere, directly from air, direct air capture, which is what global thermostat done. Those three pieces fell into place in 2020. Extraordinary year in many ways. What is needed now What's missing now is human organization to deploy all this in approximately a decade, maybe 15 years, beyond which it would be too late. As I said before, markets are very good at what they do, but they don't take into consideration the speed that is required for physical and chemical reasons. So markets now 
are driving this equation, but not at the speed that is needed. So the piece that is needed is the human organization to accelerate this process so that we can do it before it is too late, before the catastrophes are here, before they destroy the civilization we have. So that is the challenge now. And it is possible to accelerate this process using financial markets. And that's what I'm writing on now, financial instruments that bring the level of capital and liquidity to this private and successful profitable activity of cleaning the atmosphere and using the CO2 for economic growth, for the creation of jobs, for exports, generally speaking, economic progress of humankind. So that is what I'm involved in doing now. Create, help creating, and I have patented now, as I patented the global thermostat technology, it has 70 patents, I now have a patent pending for the type of financial instrument that can attract a lot of resources, financial resources, to accelerate the process of the infrastructure that has to be needed. Tens of thousands of the plants we're talking about, and they have to be profitable so everybody is engaged. It cannot be done by one firm. It has to be done by everybody, everybody in the planet. Like solar energy will be used by everybody. And energy is a global activity. It's a production that you know, has, is done uh, in, in, by the trillions in financial terms all over the world. So that's what we need to do now. It's, a, it's an economic transformation. And it's starting to happen, but it needs to be accelerated through the production of financial instruments that are similar to so-called um, mortgage-backed security instruments that were that are trillions of dollars worth, and they were used for a basic need, which is to solve a problem and solve some of the worst problems. Uh, in the housing market, which is a basic human need. Even the conservative uh, government of Margaret Thatcher uh, was helping with this, financial, this type of financial institutions to make the housing industry benefit from financial instruments like mortgages and the securities that are backed by mortgages in order to grow the stock of uh, real estate that is needed for a basic human need. Now we need to do something similar to that. And that's what I'm working on. I can explain. So speaking of basic needs, I want to get to the crux of our conversation, which is the why and what drives you. But I would like to go all the way back to, you know, when you first started thinking about basic needs back in Argentina, what drew that to your attention and what motivated you to move in the direction of trying to solve that? What is your why? Well, Argentina is not a poor country, but there is a lot of poverty in Latin America as a whole. And you couldn't avoid seeing it. And although my family was middle class and... Um, we were in many ways privileged. The fact is that humankind cannot survive the type of inequality that we have all over the world, which has only increased from 1945 by two or 300%, so that you know, the inequality between the rich and the poor nations. That inequality is very um, disturbing because it is destabilizing. There is no way that our society can survive when over 1.3 billion people don't have enough food to live in the world as it is now, and don't have the basic needs uh, that they need to survive. They're in the boundary, okay? 1.3 billion people. This is not sustainable. This is the biggest threat to Everything we're talking about here, the way we do economics. Economics is the use of resources to be distributed for human survival. 
and we are not using, not producing resources, right? And that's the environmental problem. And we are not distributing it, right? So our economic structure is very primitive, very destructive, has only gotten worse. And the issue of inequality is now recognized to be very destabilizing for the world as a whole. It's not me saying it, but it's probably one of the most uh, current topics in economics. The reason why we have only a huge increase in, in inequality in the years since the Second World War, which is 80 years ago, which is a period where the, the world economy grew by leaps and bounds, and our scientific ability and economic ability increased enormously. Yet poverty and inequality has only become worse. That's also true in the United States. This has been a topic that became very uh, well known and frequently quoted in economics today. But nobody has advanced a way to resolve it. And so I wanted to say, I believe there is a way to resolve it, and it is connected to everything I said before. Because the inequality in the way humans distribute the resources in the economy is connected to the unsustainable use of natural resources. And I can explain why what happened in the year 2020 is really a ray of hope for a new economy in which these inequalities are resolved. They don't have, you don't, don't need everybody to be equal, okay? I mean, not everybody has to consume the same, but it is not reasonable and it is unacceptable. Uh, it is tragic beyond any imagination to have the number of people below the consumption of basic needs and in the verge of survival in the world economy that we have now. It's just not sustainable. It's not something that the human species can live with. So we now have, because of the fight against climate change and the three pieces that I just mentioned, we now have all the elements for a more equal society, for a new economy, which I call green capitalism, where the most basic source of economic growth, which is energy, for the first time in the history of humankind, is most efficiently obtained from the sun, because the sun is equally distributed. It shines the same all over the world, and it's equally distributed all over the nations, generally speaking. And it therefore encourages a form of growth, because growth is energy, that is more egalitarian than it was possible with fossil fuels, which is the, how the industrial economy prospered over the last few hundred years. So now we have an egalitarian input a source of energy, which is the sun. And what I said before, which is that we have also the air as a source of materials, food, energy, like synthetic gasoline, as I mentioned before, desalinated water, the production, the biofertilizers, the production of beverages and food, etc., all coming from the air because from the air you can remove CO2. CO2 is really the basic molecule of life because it has carbon. Carbon is the molecule of life. So the same way that the carbon molecule in petroleum was critical for the enormous success of the Industrial Revolution, now the carbon molecule that is in the atmosphere because we burned all those fossil fuels um, and all that petroleum, we can bring down that carbon molecule and create materials, food, the very stuff of life, uh, so that now from air and from the sun, we can run the entire world economy in a way that is therefore more egalitarian than was ever possible before. And all of this is new. 
This only turned around in the year 2020, approximately. For example, the uh, solar photovoltaic energy, where we derive energy, which is how we grow the economy from energy, that decreased in cost 80% in the, 80, in, the, in the 12 years leading to 2020, making solar photovoltaic energy lower cost than all forms of fossil fuels. So that now not only we can use energy from the sun, which is available to all, but also produce materials from the air and food and beverages and synthetic fuels, etc. So this is the first time in human history where we can derive the entire economy from the sun and the air, which are equally distributed for everybody on earth. So it's a, it's a very unusual moment in human evolution. And it all came together in the year 2020. So I wanted to point out that this is happening right now. It hasn't finished. It's only starting now. So I appreciate the observation regarding inequality and the economic structural problems. But I'm going to come back to this question and ask you, why you, Graciela? You said you grew up in a middle-class household. You, you know, seem to be pretty comfortable growing up. Why did you decide to pursue this big problem? For a simple reason. When trying to decide what I wanted to do, and I love music, and I love mathematics, I thought I should do what is most important. That was a simple observation that became very clear to me. I should try to do what's important, what's most important. That's what I should do what's most important. And what else is most important? What can be most import, more important than ensuring the survival of humankind? That's in our genes. In our genes, we have the instinct for survival. That's what evolution is all about. So I was just following the theory of evolution without knowing it. At the personal level, I was saying, this is what's most important. So if you ask me today, what do you want to do next year or in the next five years or 10 years? What do you want to do? I think I will close my eyes and say, I want to do what's most important. And I come back to this. It's in my genes. It's in your genes. It's in everybody's genes for the human species to survive. That's well, why I'm doing it. Well, I love the idea of looking into the future, which leads me to my next question is... 10 years out, 2030-ish, what does the future hold for global thermostat? What do you see? Immediate future or medium or long term? 2030. 2030. Okay. By 2030, our firm should be increasing in size, very large, but not as large as other firms. But uh, it should be starting to penetrate and distribute its technology and its philosophy of using the sun and the air, particularly the air, as the source of economic progress all over the world. Uh, this technology removes CO2 from air, the carbon molecule, which is so critical for human survival. So I think we are going to become a public company reasonably soon, we are making critical connections and partnerships with the biggest engineering companies in the world right now. We already have some of those. And we are building the plants that are going to feed, for example, a company like Coca-Cola uses a lot of CO2. They are probably the biggest consumer of CO2 in the world. Then it is important that the CO2 they use, instead of coming from burning fossil fuels and ruining the atmosphere, comes from cleaning the atmosphere. So that's an example. Same thing for cement. Same thing for 
synthetic gasoline. So the automobile companies are using clean gasoline. So that all of that that I'm telling you is starting now. In 10 years, it will be in full swing. And we will have distributed our technology through licenses, partnerships, and successful contracts all over the economy and all over the world. Not as much as it will be in 15 and 20 years, by which time everything I'm telling you will be commonplace. Everybody will know. In 10 years, it will still not be commonplace, but it will be sufficiently distributed that it will have the momentum to transform the world economy. Yes, by the year 2030, we will have commenced changing the world economy the way I'm explaining now. And it will hopefully bring with it, and it should, a more egalitarian as well as a more successful economy, successful in the sense of being conducive to human survival and not the other way around. Well, I look forward to seeing that vision come to fruition. My last question, I'm going to break it up into two pieces because I have two last questions for you. One is, can you give some advice to those that are listening that might be academics on how you transitioned from being an academic to an entrepreneur? Well, not really, because I am still (laughs) a professor and I'm teaching at Columbia University. A couple of years ago, I was teaching at Stanford and I've been teaching all these years and I continue to teach. So I have not completely transitioned and I don't want to transition because being a professor is perhaps the highest honor because you have the contact with the future. And you can transmit your ideas and you can learn from the students. So as I said, I don't know about the transition, but I do know that you have to believe in yourself. And whatever you want to do, if you believe in yourself and you have a clear idea, go and do it. That's what I think. Well, Graciela, that fulfills both questions. I really appreciate your time today. Is there anything else you'd like to share before we go? Yes. I wanted to say the global thermostat is great and environmental sustainability is critical and the world economy is being changed and has to be changed. All of that is true. But your listeners are the critical element in all this. So what's important is for people like you to transmit what's possible and to light those lights that need to be lit in order for the transformation to be real, to happen, take place, be distributed, and lead to a harmonious future for the human species, harmonious with the planet and not against the planet. So it is not what I'm saying that is important, although I believe it is important, but what your listeners and whoever is here listening and participating with us to do it. Am I wrong? Graciela, no, you're absolutely right. I'll continue transmitting possibilities. You continue doing possibilities, and together we'll change the world. Thank you. Thank you so much, and I look forward to catching up with you again soon. Absolutely. With pleasure. Bye. Thank you for listening. If you like our show, please give us a rating and review on iTunes. And you can show your support by sharing our show with a friend or reach out to us on social media where you'll find us under our Nexus PMG handle. If there's a subject or topic you'd like to hear about, send me an email, btu at nexuspmg.com or contact me via our website, nexuspmg.com. And while you're there, you can sign up for our monthly newsletter where we share what we're reading and thinking about in the clean tech, green tech sectors. Bigger Than Us is a Nexus PMG production.